For social studies today, we're going to get started with the wildlife in 1492. You guys, what page pages is this in your um, magazine? It doesn't say. It doesn't say? Nine, nine and eight. Sorry. Eight and nine. Eight and nine. So page eight and nine in your 1492 magazine. Eight and nine. Well, just to open up to where it says the wildlife in 1492. All right, are we ready to read fifth grade? Okay. Follow along with me in your magazine. All right, guys, it's okay. It's all good. Thank you for looking. Imagine seeing American buffalo or bison walking through fields in New York State or jaguars sleeping in the shade of trees in North Carolina or mountain lions chasing prey in New Jersey. You might think these things are impossible, and today they are, but they weren't in 1492. From 60 to 100 million buffalo once roamed the plains. There were no horses on the continent then. They had all died out a long time earlier. Horses wouldn't be seen again in North America until the Spanish brought them from Europe. So you guys, if we look at the map on these pages, um, you can see that they kind of mark where a lot of these animals roamed. And we're going to take a look at this more in depth in a second. Let's read the caption. Um, it says, take a look at the map and see which animals lived in your part of the country. Imagine what life must have been like back then in 1492. So I want you guys to silently find where Minnesota is. Put your finger where Minnesota is. And look closely to see what kind of animals you see. Raise your hand when you find one that you'd like to share with the class. Allison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, caribou. What else? Mackenzie. Are you talking about this right underneath the trees? Uh, no, no. One down. Here? This thing? This one? That. Yep, those look like gray wolves. What else do we see? Richie? I see a grizzly bear. And where do you see the grizzly bear? Oh, right here? Right there. Yep. Yep, there. And then there's some up here, too. Frankie. I see something like, I don't know what it is, but it kind of looks like a turtle. It's like, right? Under. Here? Is, is that maybe? No, that's a porcupine. Oh, it is a porcupine? No, it's a porcupine. The beaver and the muskrat. Is it in the Minnesota area? Yeah. It is. I see. Oh, never mind. I think it's a bird. Oh, it's a bird. Okay. What else do we see? Max. Oh, this? Yeah. That looks, yeah, that kind of looks like a, a weasel. Oh, muskrat. That makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, you guys, if you look, is, are you looking around the edge, Drew, at what they are? So if you guys look around the edge of the picture, they actually tell you what each of those are. So see how there's like words along the edge of my screen here? Yeah. Yep. So I can see, yep, we got wolves, we have bison, caribou. If you guys look in like North Dakota, there's an eagle, a bald eagle. Now, now that we've looked around Minnesota, I want you to look at different parts of the country. What are some other animals we see? Go ahead and raise your hand when you see a different one that we haven't named yet. Jack L. Some of these animals that are in North Dakota, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, and the Iowa area, yeah. uh, they might show that they look like in other pictures, but they're not just placed there like in these motions. They can travel over to very buffalo and Yep. No, that's a great point that Jack L just made. You guys, just because we see an animal at one point on that picture, does that mean they are only right there? No. no. So just like Jack L was saying, you know, all the ones in like Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, the Midwest region, they all probably traveled through the Midwest 
state. So some of the animals we see in like the Dakotas or Iowa or Wisconsin, they probably came into what is now Minnesota too. Yep, exactly. Michael, what do you see? Um, I see a crocodile down in Florida. Florida. That makes sense. And do we see a lot of those there still today? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, what else? Zoe? I see Um, are you looking at this up here? Um, yes. Yep. 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 No, yep. Bald eagle. Drew. A buck? Nice. Nice. Eosius. A jaguar? Allison. What? Plants? No, clams. Clams. Cool. What else are we seeing? Um, what would I call them? Jack Pete. Ferrets. Okay. Um, Max? A mountain lion? Oh, yeah. Down here. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Mm hmm. Nice. Layla. An acorn. An acorn. Yep. There's also plants on here. Um, Frankie. I see a tree. Oh, you see. Oh, yeah. Right here. Yep. Yeah. The building there. Yep. Zoe. Human, oh, yep, dogs? No, human dogs. Where? Human dogs in right here. Oh, there's a suit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're hunting, honey. They're hunting. Mm -hmm. The Sioux. Yep, the Sioux. Jack L., did you have something you wanted to share? Oh, nice. Elena. Passenger pigeons, cool. Drew? I see mountain goats and cheetahs. Nice, mountain goats and cheetahs. Chanel? Um, like up there, I see like a, a cave or a cabin type house thing coming up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, up. right here? Yep. Uh, Max? Okay, so there's one that house that's going to try. Yes. Where the macaw live? I think you're right. Allison? Richie, can you shut that door for me? Oh, yeah. Like parrots are colorful birds. All right, last one, Layla. Yeah. Yeah, do you guys see the fruits yeah. over here? Yes. I also see strawberries, I think. Mm-hmm, down here. We see strawberries. Yeah. So, you guys, can you all find, have we been able to find, like, plants and animals that we can find pretty easily now? Yeah. Have we found animals that maybe aren't as easy to be found now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they said that bison... There used to be 60 to 100 million buffalo in the plains. Is there that much anymore? Uh -oh. No. Yep, yeah, they were they were overhunted once settlers came over. Mm -hmm. So, ready to rock? Ready to roll. Playing for you. How do you think the type of animals and plants where these people lived affected how they lived? So think about that question. Like if you're living in Minnesota in 1492, what's now Minnesota, how did the animals and plants available to you affect how you live? Turn and talk with the people around you. How did it affect that? And it's all the 
Who can answer my question? How do the animals and plants available where you live affect how you live? Zoe? Uh, oh, I thought you were talking about how it was Yep, those are some good points. You know, it affected how you ate, what you survived off of, and also you couldn't really be traveling too far because during this time period, they didn't have cars or trains or planes. They were on foot. You know, they mentioned up above, nope, they mentioned up above that um, horses wouldn't be seen in North America until the Spanish brought them from Europe. So there weren't even horses during this time. So where you lived, you were kind of constricted to that area for your hunting and getting your types of food and plants and stuff. So that really, I, I, I wouldn't really want to say limited because they still had a lot of choices, but it decided what you ate and how you survived. Yep, very hard to travel. You're exactly right. Allison. Um I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, except for zoos, yeah. Uh, there's like mountain lions, but yeah, like cheetahs and those types of animals. No, I would say no, no. Yeah, because here that's a cheetah, isn't it? Down here, but kind of by Mexico. Yeah, that's a cheetah. Yeah, so there are animals that now we're like those are wild here. They they used to be at one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this could have been a specific type of cheetah that was overhunted and isn't alive anymore. The cheetahs that are in on other continents, that might be a different like breed of that cheetah. Yes, Will. Yeah, I suppose there are probably animals in the less explored areas of North America, like desert areas where, you know, people don't survive very easily. So there may be animals there that we don't even know about right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, types of snakes. All right, let's flip. So did we skip two pages then, guys? Is that what you were trying to tell me? We didn't skip any pages? No, okay. the Okay. Now we're gonna go to, is it the Eastern Woodland Peoples? Is that the next one? Okay. Now let's go to the Eastern Woodland Peoples. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ready to rock. Okay, follow along with me. 500 years ago, forests covered the Eastern half of North America. So that would be like the right half of North America. Some early European explorers described the forests as open and park-like. That was because Native Americans cleared the underbrush with controlled burning in many areas. Have any of you seen a controlled burning of like a prairie before? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. So the purpose, so you guys, you know, there are wildfires in California right now. Those aren't a controlled burn. They are fires that are out of control and they're trying to fight. But sometimes what um, people do is they have what's called a controlled burn where they purposefully burn like part of a forest or a prairie just to kill off the dead um, plants, kind of that undergrowth or that brush on the 
floor and they it's completely controlled so once it's done burning what it needs to then they put it out and it's good and what that does is it kind of stimulates new plants to grow so you know they make sure it's not like burning down trees or anything but it's burning out all the dead plants so then new plants can come and grow jack l um they check the where they don't want it to keep going and that kind of just kills the fire. Exactly. And they will sometimes, spe I mean, not during like this time period, but now when there are controlled burns, they'll have like water trucks along the edges too to put out any fire that gets across like where they want it to. Yes, Zoe. Yeah. And they were talking about like, you know, when you walk in, like how there's like, I think it's community or something. Yeah. Um, they said that they can pull for that stuff too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So certain plants that they might want to, you know, burn the dead stuff and then um, invigorate like new wheat to grow. Exactly. So that's what a controlled burn is. So Native Americans would clear the underbrush in these forests with controlled burning. They also cleared fields for farming and made paths through the forest. Those paths eventually became roads and then highways. So you guys, some of the roads that we drive on might have once been paths that Native Americans took and they cleared out. Isn't that amazing to think about? Yeah. yeah. In 1492, the Iroquois people lived in northern New York State. The Iroquois were not one people, but a group of five separate peoples. The Mohawk, the, I think it's Seneca, the Oneida, the, I think it's Onondaga, and the Cayuga. Each lived in a different area of the forest. The women did most of the farming. The men hunted and waged war. Men had to defend the villages against war parties from other groups, and they also tried to expand their territories, their own territory, so get more land. Boys were trained to be brave warriors when they grew up. Right now, no one in this Iroquois village is doing any work because everyone has stopped to watch an exciting ball game. It looks pretty rough. Let's see how the game is played. So if we look at that picture, what sport does this look like? Raise your hand. What sport does this look like? Jack Pete. Lacrosse. Lacrosse, definitely. So partly for fun and partly for serious training, Iroquois women and men played the game we now call lacrosse. Players fought for control of a small ball, throwing and catching it with a basket-topped stick. Games were used for battle training. They could have 1,000 players per team and last several days. In such cases, goalposts were often miles apart. Think about that. Having to um, play, yeah, miles apart. That's crazy. Um, the players tried to hurt opposing players to knock them out of the game, and broken bones were common. Now, is that what lacrosse is like now? No, no you're, you're not trying to break people's bones. It could happen, but you're not trying to. With the Iroquois, they tried to because, like they said, it was partly for fun, but partly to train, you know, young boys how to fight, too. All right. So, yeah, let's look at that mask. It says, this wooden false face mask belonged to an Iroquois healer. The Iroquois believed members of the False Face Society had special powers. When the members came to heal someone, they wore masks like this one. The masks gave them the power to frighten away the spirits that caused the illness. So the masks were supposed to look kind of weird and kind of creepy because they were trying to um, scare away the spirits because they believed that when someone fell ill, a spirit was the cause of that illness. So they wanted to frighten away the spirit so that the person they're trying to heal would get better maybe sometimes i don't know it did. Uh, i would assume it did sometimes yeah in their culture yeah okay now if we look at that little map it says the northeastern woodland culture stretched from the atlantic coast to the midwest and great lakes so that purple area that's where they resided the iroquois the iroquois nation was centered in what is now upstate new york Oh. Do you guys have a picture of a longhouse on yours? Yeah. Okay. So, 
It's a different one? Okay, we're going to do this one, and then we're going to look inside. So a longhouse says, it's easy to see why the Iroquois called their homes longhouses. The buildings were 80 to 100 feet long or longer. A longhouse was shared by 10 or 12 related families. Half the families lived on one side of a long center space, while the other half lived on the opposite side. So you guys, it's kind of like how we have classrooms on this side of the hallway and on that side of the hallway. That's what they mean on, um, op on um, opposite sides, yeah. Families who lived across from, from each other shared a cooking fire in the center. Smoke escaped through holes in the ceiling. Iroquois families formed clans, and there were several sets of clans within each nation. The people took part in their government by joining councils, which held meetings for making decisions. They believed in decision-making by consensus or agreement by everyone in the council. Does that sound similar to how our government, government runs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're right, Max. So it had to be a consensus, meaning everyone agreed. Otherwise, whatever they were trying to do, they wouldn't do. For our government, it's majority. So, so it'd be like we vote, you know, for our president, vote in a president, and whichever person gets the most votes, they become president. In the Iroquois, in their society, every single person would have to vote for something otherwise they would not pass it through so that would be like every single american in our country agreeing on one person to run the country and then that person could run our country so that's the difference they're similar but different yes max yeah Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a good point, Max. You know, their society was not nearly as big as our American government is. It would be really hard, don't you think, for every single person in our entire country to agree on one person? Yeah. So that's why, like Max said, that's probably why ours is a majority vote instead of a consensus where everyone has to agree together because we have so many more people. Jack L. I wonder what they called Oh, what they called lacrosse back then? I know that's a, an interesting question. I wonder, I'm not sure what they called lacrosse back then. All right, let's look inside. Oh, uh, do you guys have a picture of it inside? No. Oh, okay, well then, Let's set, oh, down here. Okay, explore inside the Iroquois longhouse. So do you guys have this on yours? No. Okay, so do you see how long that is? And I can okay. zoom in. Yep, so you have someone in here and you can see it, it's kind of like two levels, right? And then we've got a fire. Yep, it says, yeah. Yeah, so pretty cool, I have to say. And you can look around. They would hang, um, you can't really see this, but this is like um, an animal skin, probably from hunting. They would use, There's they have baskets and blankets. Oh yeah, I can look behind me, that's cool. Yep, sure does. Yeah, so it's just, I don't think so. Yeah, they're like beds, you guys. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. yeah, and like Jack L said, the blankets and sheets are made out of like animal hides and hair. So they, like we talked about, they use every part of the animal. It's very responsible hunting. We're not going into the fire, but yeah, I can zoom in. That's what I can do. But you can see they're cooking something. Yeah. Yep. All right, so a wooden cradle board, follow along with me, like this one, made it easier for a mother to carry her baby while she did chores or travel through the forest. Because when women would have babies, they would still have to be able to help with chores because as a community, they all work together. The baby's wrapped in soft animal skins to keep it warm. Then it was tied to the board, of course, with like soft restraints. But the reason why they did that is because they didn't want the baby to accidentally like roll over and off of it. So it's kind of like if you've ever seen people who have like 
um, like the baby harness where the baby's kind of like to their chest. And it's kind of like that idea. The cradle board was padded with moss to make a soft cushion for the baby. Okay, and then do you guys have a picture of beans on yours? Yeah. Okay, so the Iroquois called corn, beans, and squash the three sisters. They were always planted together because each plant helped the other. Bean vines wrapped around the corn plants as they climbed upward. Squash vines spread everywhere, crowding out the weeds. They also shaded the ground, which kept the soil from drying out. Iroquois were fond of corn cakes and corn pudding. And they used corn husks to make moccasins, masks, and other items. And are those things that we use today too? Yeah. You might have a pair of moccasins at home that you wear around your house. Yeah. They're like um, kind of like slippers in a way. You slide them on your feet, but they're made a certain, like a specific way. Okay. So then we've got a picture of this lovely buck here. It says, like other Native American peoples, the Iroquois showed, showed great respect, great for respect for the plants and animals that provided them with food, medicines, and raw materials for tools, clothing, and the other things. The Iroquois hunted, fished, and gathered wild mushrooms, nuts, berries, and other fruits. When the Iroquois killed an animal, they used all of its parts. The fur or skin made clothing, antlers and bones were fashioned into tools, after an Iroquois hunter killed a deer, he would say a prayer of thanksgiving to the animal. In the prayer, the hunter would thank the deer for giving up its life to help the hunter's people survive. Yeah, so would you re would you consider this a respectful way of hunting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very yeah, respectful. Be exactly. And you guys, um, you might hunt or you might know people in your family who hunt. And a lot of good hunters, you know, when they kill like deer hunting, for example, since it's about that time. Um, when they hunt deer and they kill a deer, they might say a prayer, um, but they might also, you know, people like being outside and hunting, but when they kill the animal, there usually is a little twinge of sadness because you did just take an animal's life. So take a lot of hunters will take a moment to either silently or out loud thank that animal for giving up its life to provide food. So. Um, if you know anyone who hunts, you could ask them, you know, do you, what do you, how do you thank the animal, Mr. you know, Krakenberg. for its life? Mr. Krakenberg, Krakenberg, he's a big hunter. He's a big hunter. He went to I've been in the past and 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 i have I, I think a lot of hunters do think of deer, deer mounts as respect, respect for that animal. Um, Allison. Yeah, so it's kind of like how they talked with another one of the communities we spoke about, how they could use certain organs as like pouches and kind of that kind of stuff. I know it's weird to think about, but yes, they would use every part of the animal, including the organs. Mm -hmm. Well, the heart, they may have kind of kind of ground up with the meat and kind of made that all together as food. Yeah, you can eat deer heart. Mm -hmm. No, probably not. Mainly like tools. Elena. That's okay. All right, that is where we are going to stop for today, fifth grade. Great discussion.